All right, we're kind of uh, not necessarily in between projects, but uh, haven't been doing anything video where Lita has been buttoning up stuff that's been ongoing. So we're gonna do another episode of the, uh, or another installment of the Oliver employee videos. Uh, today is our second John for the trip. Uh, John K this time. Um, the Kind of the interesting thing about his story is if you pay attention to how just how many times he he was laid off and went back over the course of his employment there, which at the period of time where he was working there between the in the seventies and eighties, layoff especially late seventies and obviously the eighties during the farm crisis layoffs were not just an Oliver thing. He um he actually mentions, and we talk a little bit about he worked at John Deere, is one of it during one of his layoffs at Oliver. And um, the, since the ag industry has got so many ups and ups and downs, it, it, you know, get laid off from Oliver, go to John Deere, get laid off from John Deere, go work for somewhere else, get laid off there, just kind of bouncing around because that's the nature of the ag industry. And he said the difference is, whereas with the size of the companies where Oliver might lay off three, four hundred people at a time, John Deere would be laying off three, th three or four thousand people at a time. So. But that was kind of one of the interesting things about his story. Um, he kind of did a fair number of jobs while he was there, or while over the many times he was there. Um, I feel like he had more stories to give, but he was kind of in a rush because his wife was waiting in the car. So uh, we got about 30 minutes out of him. Um, good, more good stuff. So um, I think that's what I needed to do to get you guys up to speed on this go around. So. Here's our next John. We're good to go. Well, my name is John Kenter. I started there at White's in uh, July of uh, 74, right after we got married. My wife and I got married on the 20th, and I started there at the end of that month. I had gotten laid off at, at a A.Y. McDonald's machine shop in Dubuque. On a Friday, we got married on Saturday, and the following Monday, I started at White. So it's kind of a busy week. We didn't get much of a honeymoon there. <laughs> but uh, we, at that time, it was really a good place to work. I mean, you figure you could rent a farmhouse for under $100 a month. And, you know, you're, you're, you have plenty of money. Every month, every week, for whatever you wanted, you know. I think we, you always had at least you had two cars and a and a comfortable home and and money left over. So that was about the, one of the few jobs you ever had money left over. But I think I worked there from seventy four, the middle of seventy four, until oh, sometime in toward the and the 75 before I got a layoff. And I worked on the gear case line, rear frames. And uh, the guys I worked with were, there was like three, three operations on that, on those rear frames. A rougher, and another rougher, and a finisher. And then, then it went on to the groover. And uh, I worked with Fred Dravis and uh, Orville Osmondson. And uh, they taught me a lot. Uh, before, before our operation, there was a drill press drilled out the holes in the bottom and a mill that, uh, that I ran. And uh, then went on to the next rougher and then on to the finisher. And uh, that was a Pretty fair job. You were talking about the, I heard you guys talking about the 550 and the 70, 770 there. Those were the two hardest gear cases to hold tolerances. It's hard to hold a tolerance on them. And uh, I think it was probably half the, half the problem was that the jigs were, like okay. you said, they were so old. You know, you had to be a really experienced machine operator to 
to hold a good tolerance, like those guys up in number one that ran those engine lathes and them old lathes forever. They ran them forever, but they never, they could, they could keep them within a thousands or a half thousands every time. And they were so old and sloppy that those guys, but they were just that good, you know? And, uh, well, that's the way the turret lays were down there along the wall. Yeah. They were World War II vintage stuff. Right. Yeah, they were. Until they came in and got the maze axe yeah. and, and uh, completely changed oh, exactly. how things were done. But. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was amazing. I, uh, after that layoff, that layoff, I think then I went back, that was in like in 76. I think I had four different jobs in 76. I worked at Winnebago, I worked at White's, I worked on the railroad. And you were saying there was something about the insurance there. The, the, uh, John was just saying, I had two free kids that I never paid a dime for. My son was born in uh, in July of 76, and I was working on the railroad. So the railroad took care of my wife all the way up until birth. And then Whites took care of Nathan after, after he was born. So, I mean, they just switched, you know. And uh, that, I never had to pay a, a dime for them, either one of my kids. My daughter, I was working at John Deere's and talking about good insurance, it was the same, the same thing. Never paid a dime for her either, working at John Deere's. So, uh, well, let's see. Towards, I had been kind of looking around for different jobs because, well, you get laid off, you don't get laid off. You do this, you do that. It's getting kind of a, so it was during one of the layoffs, I was in the unemployment office and uh, it said Waterloo Tractor Works. Of course, John Deere was hiring. So I filled out one of those little cards and it came back, come in for an interview. And at the time, my foreman was Lynn Weatherall. So him, Lynn and Bryce Menzi and John Ross, and it was a guy that had the blonde slick back hair. And uh, oh, he worked up in number one for a while and he worked in, worked in number seven too. I can't, I can't think of his name, the foreman. But anyway, they they were all standing there, and I said, "Hey, I just got this uh, notice from John Deere to come in for an interview. What do you guys think?" And they said, "Take it, go for it. You know, you're young now." And like old Fred Davis, he said, at the time when he was young, my age, twenty five, twenty six, if he'd have stayed at John Deere instead of going at White's, you know, he'd have been retired and out of there and, you know, and had a better pension and more pension. And I said, go ahead. They, all these guys said, go for it. These older guys said, go for it. So I did. And in January of, of 77, I started at John Deere. Worked at John Deere for six years or so, six or seven years. Uh, and I, in in nineteen in November of eight in eighty two, the 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 week that I got laid off, there were thirteen hundred of us on the board that they because they'd been laying off five hundred week here, six hundred there, a thousand another week, and I just kept bumping and bumping and bumping my way down until I was shifting weights and dumping behind the squeeze molders down the old in the old foundry and hanging weights on the paint line and and oh it, that was a I'll tell you what that'll put give you put you in shape 
And uh, then finally, I, like I say, there was 13 other of those on the board. And it didn't take too long. That was in 82, and then it didn't take long. I had a couple other jobs in between. And Byers called me up. He said, you want to go to work? I said, doing what? And I was surprised. I said, how'd you get my name? He said, well, we were going back through some of the old roll call and roll, the roll, looking up some guys, seeing if they wanted to come back to work for a while. Yeah, I'm not doing nothing. Do what? He said, second shift fork truck. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So I went back and I was, this is a story I was telling Al the other day. It was just like I'd taken a short vacation. I didn't, I didn't need any break in or any, I knew that, I knew where everything was. I knew where the guys, some of the same old guys were on the same old machines. And it, like I say, it was just, it was weird. It was just like I'd taken a short vacation. And you're talking about those 770s, those 77s. And 550s. They couldn't, well, they were going to have a short run uh, redos uh, on those those old tractors. But they needed that jig. They needed the jig for that 77. And the jigs, plural. And, oh, I don't know where we put, where are they? I said, well, I, I bet I know. I said, I think I know. Well, yeah, go see. So I went up in that mezzanine in number, in number one, above the, you know, above the finishers up there. And sure enough, way in the back in the corners were the, those two jigs. I looked at the tag and my name was on, my initials were on for putting them up there. <laughs> 12 years before. <laughs> and I got them out. Well, where'd you find them? I said, well, they were up there right where I put them 12 years ago. <laughs> so that was kind of a, that was a fun one. And then I know I lasted a while there with the, at the fork truck and then I, I got laid off again, of course. And, and then it wasn't too much longer after that, they, they called me up to come to work in Heat Treat. So I came to work and worked in Heat Treat and one of the rotary ovens, on one of the rotary ovens, me and another guy, Tom Bonnet, you remember Tom? Oh yeah, Tom. Tom and I worked together on that, on those rotaries for a while. And, uh, and oh, I can't say, so I can't think of some of the, the guys that worked in the, in the draw furnaces and the, up in the other end up there. But that was, was quite a, quite a deal. And I kind of, then I can't remember if I got laid off that time or I think I must have gotten laid off that time. <clears throat> and I went back again another time and I said, uh, you got anything for us today? Well, I went to work on the mills and Ernie Lyle was a, was the foreman and worked on those mills for quite a while. Down in cast iron? Yeah, maybe? yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. doing hydraulic housings or oh, a little bit of everything, I guess. Housings, all housings, yeah. and uh, uh, oh, I can't remember who all. Well, it was in number seven. It was down there in number seven, right by the number seven check room, just to the to the uh, well. It would be the east side. The east end of uh, num of the number seven check room, and right across the right across from the, the number seven check room window was the was the gear case yeah, line, yeah. and then across from that was the line, the assembly line. Yeah, yeah and uh, and there was some of those uh, see there was a couple of CNC machines in there between, and uh, by that time. And uh, they might have moved some stuff in. They there. moved After some stuff I, around. I was down and said that was. I left in '76, so yeah. they probably moved. 
you know, things were, they all did kind of move some things around over the years that, you know. When, well, well, when they went well, to the newer, newer 135s and that, they put all those machining centers in. Yeah, yeah. That displaced a lot of machines. They did that to us down in Beers, too. I worked on a, uh, worked on the, uh, worked on a bullard vertical, like six spindle vertical, uh, making planetary pinion carriers. And uh, there was there was two of those bullards, a brooch, and then a mill, and you know, and then a bore mat, a bore matic, and then a, then the washer was just across the aisle, and they got three new CNC machines from Switzerland or whatever, and the guys came with them. The the the, the technicians came with them to set them up, and it. We were obsolete immediately, you know. We were obsolete. Our whole department was obsolete. But uh, I mean, so there's sim there were similarities between whites and deers all along, you know. That that uh, um, so after that uh, um, heat treat ordeal. It wasn't, I shouldn't say that. It wasn't that bad. It was, uh, uh, it was okay. It was okay. And uh, they called me back again. Buyers called me back again. And I, I had asked him that last time, that one time, because I still had my same number, you know. Employee number. Employee number, the whole bit, you know. Uh, 6677 and I, same one, always one, one, yeah. four. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same number 12 years later. And uh, uh, they called, they were going to close down then at that time. It was time to close. And they said, you want to come and help clean up or stuff like that? Well, sure, I guess I will, you know. And uh, I had, I owned the bar in Riceville, the, the hangout, you know, at that time. And I said, well, I can't be there every day, you know. I've, I've got a business to run, and for a lot of times on Fridays, I won't. I've got stuff going on on Fridays. Well, that's okay. That's okay. That's yeah, okay. Whatever. <laughs> so uh, that Moser, that was the timekeeper, he uh, was supposed to be in charge of us. Uh, cleaning up and taking things. Well, I was, they gave me the up above number seven check room. So there was all kinds of neat shit up there. was new, newer snap gauges and drill bits and, and oh, lots of stuff, neat stuff, good stuff. And I'd clean it up, put it in a, put it in a bin and then take it down and put it in another bin. If it was good over here, if it wasn't good over here. And I had it, I had the room all cleaned up, pretty much cleaned up. And I know I, I knew I was gonna be put somewhere else. And I told that Mosher, I said, well, because I was under the impression that they were gonna have a big sale and sell all this stuff, you know. Well, take it down to the bullpen Goes to junk, goes to the junk. I, what? You know, because I've always been kind of a pack rat anyway, you know. You didn't grow up with nothing, you don't throw things away. I said, I said what do you mean? He said, I thought there was going to be an auction. Oh, no, no, this, this stuff, we're going to, it'll go to the bazook. The junk man across the track. <laughs> About that time, I mean, I, I was amazed. I said, man, all this good stuff. About that time, Arnie came walking by, Arnie Lowe. I said, Arnie, get me out of here. I can't do that. I can't throw this stuff away. I can't just, I said, just, I, it irks me. Just too bad to, to, to throw it away. He said, okay, I'll see what I can do. So Arnie got me back on the mills again. And I was on the mills until the very end the very end of the last day. 
So, you know, experiences? Yeah, there's lots of experiences. Lots of, I don't know, I guess adventures. You'd go, we'd get off at midnight, you know, or whatever, second shift, and you'd walk out through, past, through the one corner of the, the old foundry and out another door and out through the gate. And there was always, that was, for years and years, there was always a guard at the gate, a gate guard. And after a while, they didn't even bother with having a gate guard. You could have took out, you could have taken the, anything out of there. They wouldn't even, who cares? Well, I think that kind of went to a private company. I think it did. Yeah, because when I was down there, uh, Gail and Morse, worked on on second shift and he he and another guy were touring the plant all the time at night. Yeah. And when I was a supervisor there was some stuff going on at night and we kinda knew about it and we caught some people pit going out during your lunch and pitching stuff over the fence. Oh yeah. And going back and I picking heard, it up later. I had heard of that. Yeah, but I didn't yeah. about that. And that wasn't just that didn't go on just prior to seventy six. That went on for years. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. But as far as my part, I tried to do what I could do and keep an eye on things. Yeah, yeah. Well I didn't want I you know, you could have I could have you could have taken you could have taken dial indicators, you could have taken snap gauge, adjustable snap gauges, you could have taken just about anything. I I didn't even want a rag, you know. I did you know, I just didn't it, down like at Deers, the same kind of thing. You'd walk through the gate, past the gate guard, and of course you're always gonna have a red rag sticking out of your back pocket, you know. Well they just Pull, you know, just yank it, just pull it. Oh, hey, sorry, man. There you go. But you know, I, I, I think it was shortly after this private company took over, they'd have lunch pail checks. You know, you'd have to open it, mm-hmm. which they did at Deers all the time too. Spot checks. You'd open up your lunch bucket and close it up. Yep, go on, go on, go on. But then after a while, they they must have just lost interest and. And uh, didn't even have have a, a guard posted at the gates, so I don't know. Other than that, I guess I pretty much I'm done with that. I uh, well, the the problem with white was it was on off on off on off all the time. Yeah. And oh, you'd go like hell for a while, and then you'd lay off. And for some of the farm farm guys, it was seemed to be okay because they could get some work done at home and then go back to work. And you know, it was just. And some of the older guys hardly ever got laid off, you know. And uh, but the younger ones, which we were, at that which time. we were, yeah, uh, we were always getting laid off, you know. And you never knew, like like you said, you never knew what you were coming back to. No, you didn't know what you were coming back to, you, and you didn't know how long it was going to be. You know that was the, and then if you if they called you and you weren't available, or if you were doing something else, it you know it it better be a good job mm-hmm. because you couldn't afford not to go back, and then that that ruins your reputation as a. As a worker, a if job you, hopper. yeah, if you're if you're a job hopper and you and you leave someone to go back to this other job, it kind of it kind of hurts your reputation. Well, what if you on you know, your next application, where did you work the last five years or whatever? It uh, yeah, it hurt. That part hurts because in those days, well. In the early, in the late 70s and early 80s, like Deers was going great guns. I mean, they were going hard. And until like the last 
couple of years I worked there, the last year or two, you had to keep bumping because you, unless some of those guys thought that, oh, they take the early layoff because this can't last long. This can't last long. Oh, it was right during the farm crisis time. I mean, no, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna bump as long as I can. Hang on, and and it was the same at beer, at White. You you bumped or stayed where you were until you absolutely didn't have a job at all, and then uh, it was. Basically, just happy to have a job. Yeah, yeah. Have a paycheck coming in. Yeah. And then once you did well, I, like I said there was thirteen hundred. Was at deer that time, and and a lot of times at White's it was like three hundred, you know, or four hundred that would get laid off in a week time, weeks, in a week's time. But of course they weren't. We weren't. We weren't as big at White, but. That, that still, you know, two, three hundred people getting laid off is a big chunk coming out of a workforce of, well, the workforce varied, I guess, in size over the years, but. And it kind of disrupts the operation inside, too, because you get people that are bumping down and they got to get back in the flow of, of the job they had. And the old guy isn't going to teach them nothing. Exactly. The old guy's gonna say, yeah, you just uh, turn it on, turn it off. You're kind of at their mercy. And and another thing is, during that busy time, a lot of guys when they needed bodies, they put you on like a a tape drill. So you had the tape drill drill class, and that class meant that you had. The other class is below it. So even though you just knew how to run this, this one, machine. one machine, you were classified to run everything below it. So when you got bumped off of that machine, you had to go to a machine you didn't know anything about. Yep. Yeah. And that's what was chaos. Yeah. That for was supervisors. Oh, you know, su supervisors and individuals together. You didn't know. You, you knew you were going to get in trouble because you couldn't hold tolerance. You couldn't hold. You just didn't know how to do it, and you couldn't make great at all. No. Because the old guys had all the good jobs. They were getting the rate. They were making rate. You were doing twenty percent. You know, and to make any money, you had to be making. You had to do one hundred and forty percent. If you made over 140 percent, then the the day guy got mad at you. Yeah. And no, our our time study came. Time study come, and that's what you, they didn't you didn't want. And uh, yeah, it was the same way in every factory ever. In that's, what, just, that's it, the game that was played. Uh, yeah, Winnebago. Any, they're not going to show the new guy how to how to do it. And do it right. I mean, whether it's whatever. Well, I worked at Winnebago for I think a month before I got on the railroad, <laughs> and it, it was the same there, same everywhere. You got to show the new guy. He might someday get your job. <laughs> so, I think uh, that's about it for me. I. Uh, well, that that was was very interesting. Obviously, you got some years working at Deer. So, what kind of cool stuff did you do there? Oh, at Deer, so I don't know. I guess I that was one of those ones that was so steady that you didn't and you didn't know an awful lot of guys, you know, because it was they were, everybody was from all over, you know. Uh, did you commute from Riceville? Down? No, we, we, we. I when I started there at Deers, I stayed with some some friends down in uh, Waterloo, and uh, a man, a guy and his wife, 
and they put me up in the, like the front porch. And then my wife and I'd make it home like twice a week. And then we decided we'd better start looking for a, we bought a trailer, a mobile home. It was a 76 art craft. And we moved it into a place in Dunkerton where you could buy your lot. It was $5,000 to buy the lot, 100 by 60 lot. And when we looked at it, oh, the place was beautiful. Yeah. It was like the springtime and summer and the hickory trees were all over the place. It's just a beautiful spot. Well, summer goes and fall comes and winter comes. It, it was a mess. It did look like hell. And we lived right next door to the Tylers. And there was 15 people living in a 12 by 60. <laughs> And they were half black, half white. Some of them were black, some of them were white. And the little kid, and the kids were. And we'd go away on the weekend. And the first time, it really bugged me. My little utility shed. The doors was the door was open. And the lock was cut, but you know, no nothing was broke. I looked around. There was nothing missing. And, and it took me a while. And I finally figured out. The Tyler kids were coming over and getting my snow shovel and my lawnmower, and they were going around, they were making money with my stuff, but they always put it back. <laughs> they were mowing lawns and, and, and shoveling snow with my stuff. <laughs> oh, I, I said, that's fine. Yeah, you guys make some, entrepreneurs. Yeah, you guys yes. make some money. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was. There's all kinds. There's all kinds of adventures everywhere you work. It doesn't matter whether you're at White's or you're, if you're at Deers or Winnebago or the railroad. I worked on the railroad too. So, but White, I think, was a place where, in those days, the money was good. You know, and it was cheaper living. You know, it was cheap living around here. And the pay was good, the insurance was good. And you wanted to hang on to that job. So, I guess that's what we did. Tried to. Tried to, as long as we could. Yeah, but then all of a sudden it was gone. It was gone.